Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I guess what's going I'll on go is check that. Whether we're, whether we're sending <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Or, 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 or,
uh, is Alex Graves with um, some wonderful work in BNCs, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, the hindsight experience replay work, um, that's a wonderful paper, Ilya Siksiva, um, and that's a part of OpenAI as well, which is um, one of um, Elon Musk has um, invested quite heavily into, into the um, uh, company. And, and here's the other one, is uh, with Tim, uh, Lil, Lil Graf and David um, Silver out of DeepMind. That does some wonderful work there. Uh, so that's, if you were interested, that's, I mean, I'm going to unpack all this and we'll go into a bit more detail over, over the coming slides. So reinforcement learning is to solve problems that can be regarded or transformed as sequential decision-making problems. DL, um, so, so deep learning, so deep, deep learning, helps reinforcement learning make so many um, achievements, such as representation learning with DL enables automatic feature engineering, end-to-end -end learning through greater consent, and meaning there's the reliance on, on domain knowledge is significantly reduced or even removed in some problems. And that's that's really important. Um, and there was a good example for recently uh, with Stockfish, and Stockfish, um, um, you've heard of it, um, in terms of chess. And it, it had a whole lot of handcrafted knowledge, and it, 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 it's a wonderful test, uh, uh, chess program. But um, Africa has thrown all that handcrafted knowledge out, and it uses um, reinforcement learning. And, and that's what's really, that's, that, it doesn't use domain knowledge, the point being, it doesn't use domain knowledge, which is, um, which is a, quite a significant achievement when you think about it. There's deep distributed representations as well. And here's just a simple, if we just look at this, this is what the data simple thing about. So we've got AI equals reinforcement learning, learning plus deep learning. And if you look at the top right, Breakthroughs over the last, you know, in 2013 and 2017, we had deep learning in 2013, and we had we've got reinforcement learning in 2017 in terms of breakthrough technologies. And I've got artificial general intelligence. Now I'll speak a bit more about that. And that, that's one of the things that DeepMind in the UK is trying to uh, address and trying to resolve is artificial general intelligence, and that's. It, it, you know, building a model, building system, not only do one task, but do multiple tasks as well. You know, so there was the AlphaGo series of programs that, you know, defeated Go, and that was a wonderful achievement. Um, but it also can be used for chess, and also be used for um, a shogi. I mean, there was a different variance to it, but, you know, it can be used for more than one thing. Um, and if you, if you look back, and you may, you may have already know this about chess, chess, uh, I think with Deep Blue in 1997, it could only do one thing. You know, it couldn't do anything else. It could just play chess. It was dumb otherwise. Um, yet, you know, you had someone like Gary Kasparov who could do all these other wonderful things as well. And I, I thought that was quite impressive. But just, just use that as a bit of intuition. And here's a bit of background, which we'll go through. Um, we've got some resources. Um, what I suggest is there's an artificial intelligence book by Stuart Russell. And Peter Norvig, um, who um, I think they're both out of um, Stanford University um, in San Francisco. Andrew Ng as well is the one machine learning course. There's a deep learning book by Ian e. Goodfellow, uh, as, uh, as well as Yoshi Abengio and Aaron Corville is the authors of that book. And the reinforcement learning book, and that's what we're going to be um, talking about, is the Sutton Barta book. So Rick Sutton at the University of um, Alberta, Canada, and we've got Andy Barta, uh, Barta as well. There's survey papers you can use as references, um, and there's a wonderful one. So you've got um, Michael Jordan out of Berkeley University. He's, uh, he's always a good resource to, to have a look at. And um, Jan Kern has done some work, and I've spoken about David Silver at course at University of, um, um, College of London, and that's not enough course you can actually. Now there's um, Sergey Levine out of UC uh, Berkeley, so that does a good course. And that's probably what I want to be able to highlight. Now, in terms of, of speaking about machine learning, now I'm talking about deep learning and reinforcement learning. Now let's, let's have a look at that a bit more. 
So machine learning may be categorized as supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And so deep learning can work with uh, as a supervised learning or unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, or other machine learning approaches. And deep learning is part of machine learning, which is part of a, um, AI, which is artificial intelligence. And there's a wonderful quote from Stuart Russell and Peter Dolby's book. Reinforcement learning might be considered to encompass all of AI. An agent is placed in the environment and must learn to behave successfully therein. And here's some further information from um, the um, Russell and Norby book. Uh, AI is discussed from four perspectives and two comparisons. So there's thought process and reasoning versus behaviour, success in terms of fidelity to human performance versus rationality, and either performance measure. And we've also got at least four ways to define AI. Acting humanely, thinking humanely, thinking rationally, and acting rationally. And then there's also the Turing test, which I'm sure you have heard about the Turing test. Um, and I guess one of the takeaways from this is you can obviously you can just read the top, but here, here are just here's some capabilities. The computer needs the following capabilities. NLP, natural language processing for successful communication in English, knowledge representation for storage of what it knows and hears, and automated reasoning for answering questions and drawing new conclusions from distilled information. Machine learning for adaption to new scenarios, detection, and exploitation of patterns, and computer vision for object perception, robotics for object manipulation and motion control. And AI researchers have been devoting most of their efforts to the underlying principles of intelligence rather than simply passing the Turing test. And what that statement means is an airplane may not simply be a bird. And and that's what that's what they're and that's how probably the best way to approach this. And if we look at the relationship between, we've got deep reinforcement learning, we've got reinforcement learning, we've got unsupervised learning, so unsupervised learning is just unlabeled data, remember. We've got supervised learning, which is labeled data sets. And we've got machine learning and artificial intelligence. And here's some key foundations, I guess, or guess key questions, if we, get a, if we had a look at the, um, Russell and Norby book, and, and the key questions they were looking at were, can formal rules be used to draw valid conclusions? How does the mind arise from a physical brain? And where does knowledge come from? And how does knowledge lead to action? And we can break it into the, these different areas, and I'm sure some of these areas are of interest. Mathematics, economics, neuroscience, psychology, uh, computer engineering and control theory and cybernetics, and logistics. There, if you, if you break it down and just choose something, it's like how does brains process information? And these are the sort of things that the scientists are thinking about. The Bear in Mind book was written in 2009. There's been a lot of work based on this book, um, and based on the Sutton Barto book as well, for companies like OpenAI, um, and companies like DeepMind, or Google Brain, um, they're all trying to look at this and try and, and they're building models um, um, trying to address these types of questions. And they're doing it using um, reinforcement learning. And you've got, you've got computer science, you've got neuroscience, you've got engineering, mathematics, economics, and psychology, you know, reinforcement learning, all, all these different components. And that's what can be utilized using reinforcement learning. And if we actually look at the history of AI, um, and if you look back, through time, so the gestation of AI, the birth of AI, we're talking about the 50s here, early enthusiasm, great expectation, a dose of reality, knowledge based systems, AI is becoming industry, so that's the 1980s. There was this, okay, can we use AI? Then it went into a bit of a winter, and then, but then they had neural networks, so um, we had Jeffrey Hinton, um, very um, passionate about neural networks. Um, AI adopts a type of method and emerges in intelligent agents. And the availability of very big uh, or very large data sets. So, the machine learning is about learning from data and making predictions and decisions. And this is probably the best quote. A 
computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and, and performance measure P if performance at tasks in T are measured by P improves with experience E. That's probably, the best, that's probably the best way to try and understand machine learning. And let's, we can, now let's break it down. We're going to talk about machine learning here, talk about deep learning, and we talk about reinforcement learning. So categories of machine learning. We've got supervised learning, so I think you know that's labeled data sets. Unsupervised learning is unlabeled data sets. And you've got classification and regression, are two types of supervised learning problems with categorical and number, numerical outputs, respectively. We've got unsupervised learning, which attempts to extract information uh, from data without labels, such as clustering and density estimation. And we've got representation learning, it's a classical type of un unsupervised learning. And that's trying to beat the um, neural networks, but supervised learning is a kind of representation learning. I'm going to refer very shortly back to um, the deep learning book by Ian Goodfellow. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just go through this. Yeah, so we've got training deep neural networks with supervised learning as a kind of representation learning. So representation learning finds representations to preserve as much information about the original data as possible, and then at the same time to keep your representation simpler or more accessible than the original idea with low dimensionality, sparse or independent representations. Now we're, now we're looking now, let's look at deep learning. We've got deep neural networks. Now, and I mentioned earlier, so Jeffrey Pink is probably the best person to actually have a look at in terms of reading papers or anything that is, uh, if you just want to get to find an understanding of neural networks. Um, it's a, now, so what deep learning is, is a particular machine learning scheme, usually for supervised or unsupervised learning. It can be integrated with reinforcement learning, state representation function, or as a function approximator. And supervised learning and unsupervised learning use one shot to consider an instant rewards while reinforcement learning is sequential, far-sighted, considering long-term accumulated rewards. And, and that's, that's going to be fairly important when we talk about optimality, finding our optimal policy, and we're talking about exploitation versus exploitation, and we're talking about our state space. So do we get, if, we do, if we exploit something over and over again, we might get an instant reward, but we might miss out on something which may be better. If we explore our state space, we only find that, okay, we're going to get something better down the track because we've explored our state space. And that's going to be something important. That's an important int intuition to take away. So well, the reinforcement learning is used as sequential decision making. There are evaluated feedbacks, but no supervised labels. It's comparing with supervised learning. Reinforcement learning has additional um, challenges. And here it comes in credit assignment, stability, and exploration. So these ones are two <coughs> in here. Stability and credit assignment, which I will Go into a bit more detail very shortly. Reinforcement learning is key, a key to optimal control, operations research and management, and psychology and neuroscience. And that's re representing some part of it. Yeah. And that's what the Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Just go back to yep. the first slide. So if you look for a holistic view yep. from a solution engineer, and a solution engineer or a software engineer needs to decide. Uh, for solution, one of these, like either it's a deep learning or reinforcement learning or representation learning, how would they decide which one to use for? Uh, Excellent, okay. And the question is how, how do I decide based on what the problem statement? That's effectively the question. That's, which is, is it's a good question. I'll, I'll, go, I'll answer that. Um, over, as, as mentioned, I've got about 300 different slides, and I've also broken it into, if we go back here, um, if I've categorized it, into different areas, such as games, robotics, NLP, communities, or you know, those sort of things. I guess the short answer is have a problem statement. What problem are you trying to solve? That's the, that's the first thing. Um, and it could be something really simple. And, and bear in mind, I mean, you could have really simple um, problems that you want to solve. And a simple logistic regression model may actually help that, may, may actually solve that problem. And uh, Adrian Ng would always say, just build something dirty. You know, just build a quick, dirty model and see how it works. So, and that's probably the first thing you take away. So, like, if you've got a labeled data set, just build something quick and dirty, have a look at it, see, um, see, see, see how it goes. Um, if you need something a bit more complex, complicated, that, then that's a different story, and that's going to be a different 
attention. That's the advice we give home staff. And we also scale. We can uh, inform about the contextual representation uh, part of it. Because, for example, if you do deep neural network, mm -hmm. does it, does those application which are going to use deep neural network, would it be taking more computational resources as compared to the other? Yeah, okay. It's, it's a good question because that, that's a question of computation. So that's, and that's why. And that's, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a sec, but that was one of the renaissance, one of the, uh, that and the work that was done in uh, 2012, in, and there was a computer image competition um, in Europe, and we had our first convolution neural network that actually resolved that, and that was the work out of um, Toronto. Um, who, and that, so uh, what I was talking about then was the other, the other aspect to is computation. So we had, you know, advancements in CPUs, which then became GPUs, um, thanks to N NVIDIA, um, and Intel, and work with Mobileye, and that's what Mobileye was doing in terms of um, autonomous vehicles. Um, and then ha that's progressed. In other words, things got a lot better in terms of computational power. So if you and if you look at deep learning, it's matrix multiplication. That's what it is. It's matrix multiplication all, all the way down. It's taking these large matrix and multiplying them. And if you've got computation, you can do this quick, really quickly. So that's that answers your question, I believe. It's like algorithms have improved and computational power has increased. So which is which has helped quite a bit. I was, yeah, oh, I think I was here. Okay. Well, this is the yeah, for of machine learning. This is something very simple. To calculate. We've got machine learning with unsupervised learning, so unlabeled data. We've got supervised learning with labeled data. And we've got reinforcement learning, which means sequential decision making. And, and so that's, a, that's probably a good information to take away. Um, and this is taken out of the deep learning book. So this is the um, Ian Goodfellow, Yoshi Fangio, and Aaron Corbett, their book. Uh, it's this event diagram showing how deep learning. Is a kind of representation learning, which in turn is a kind of machine learning, which is used uh, for many but not all approaches to artificial intelligence. And each section of the Venn diagram includes an example of the artificial intelligence technology. So we broke that down, and that probably goes further to your question as well. So the knowledge base of sort of artificial intelligence, we've got machine learning, so I spoke about logistic regression, um, and we've got um, representation low, um, learning, so shallow autoencoders, and we've got deep learning. So so if you talk about search engines, yes. yeah. which, which way would that be? For example, in the past when we talk about Yahoo or Google, yeah. and then we do a data mining and knowledge extraction of it, would it be from knowledge based extraction or? Okay, so so that was, so the, the, the search engine was based, based on the algorithm, which I built in 2012, I think it was around about there. Uh, 2002, rather, sorry. Yeah. Around, uh, well, it's initially done in 1998, and then we'll find um, that that's oh, so sorry. Yeah. Would you consider like a quantum microphone model that plays for ten percent most of the time? Because actually the yeah, or oh, maybe like that as well. Is, is that uh, sorry? Can, yeah, you, when I move over here, can you hear me? I'm not really. Sorry. Oh, you can't. Okay, I apologize. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. All right. So, is is that better? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. All right. Good. I, can, I think we can hear you, but not through the audio system. Ah, okay, all right. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, all right, so, and in terms of, uh, I think in terms of your question, I think this slide may actually uh, sure. answer that, because I think I might have had that in mind when I was writing this. And, and when I was putting this together, it was, it, it was for that reason. It's like, there's these wonderful achievements, and wonderful things that happen, but where do I start? You know, what do I look at? What resources do I utilise? Um, you know, I, I, I want to do something with, to make a contribution, and that's that's I guess the um, the premise behind trying to put a slide back together like this. Um, so we've got big data, um, we've got data science, and that's something I'd like to unpack um, with what's happening in big data. Because there's there was some wonderful work from the Google Fossils and algorithm through the HDFS, through the Yarn, um, through the you know those sorts of things which allow uh, um, big data. I'm talking about MapReduce to people, MapReduce, um, which allowed um, big data to become you know something we're all talking about, uh, and data science. And there's a wonderful book, um, if you're looking from a data science perspective, um, from a statistics perspective, the essentials of um, statistical learning by uh, Trip Hasty. Um, it's, it's a wonderful book to, to actually have a, have a read and have a look at. Um, it gives you a really good foundation in data science. 
We've got predictive modeling and there's data mining as well. Um, and there's some great tools you can utilize in data mining uh, and information retrieval, computer vision, and robotics. And I'll get more into robotics because they have the work that Peter Abil's team's doing um, um, in the United States and with some um, wonderful people such as Chelsea Chibig um, and Sergo Levine. And they're just really passionate and modest and um, down to earth people who are sharing their knowledge. And yeah, so here's the book here. So we'll look probably here in six pieces that are hasty there. And we've got Kevin um, Murphy as well as done a wonderful book and um, beat me. And I think you might have heard of um, him. Um, he, I've got a slide to talk about SVMs very shortly based on the MNIST data set. Um, and everything was about the, uh, SVMs and it was all um, before we actually started using convolutional neural networks. Um, and he, he sort of um, led that field for a period of time. I'm, I'm talking about the 90s here, so around about the 90s. Um, and so machine learning is a subset of AI. Um, how it's involved in the traditional fields of AI. And so if we look at a machine learning, learning algorithm, it's fairly simple. We've just got a data set with cost and loss function. We've got an authorization procedure, and we've got a model. Um, and a good reference is good. Um, is Andrew Ng uh, and Ian Goodfellow. They're really good references. And was somebody asked me earlier, we we're talking about this earlier, this, this is something just really, really quick and dirty, just putting together. It's, uh, it's a data set provided to non overlapping training and validation and testing subsets. A cost and loss um, function measures the model's performance with respect to accuracy, like the mean squared error, um, in regression or classification error. And this is just breaking into here's our you know, data, here's a training set, here's a dead, and here's our test. And this is your holdout. So this is what you do with cross validation um, and, and, and and you work on um, to, to, to try and tune your model with high parameters and those sorts of things. And we'll talk about the um, regularization strategies, which I'll talk about very shortly. Um, and we've got loss functions as well. And, and this is just um, a paper from Kevin Murphy's book. Um, and I guess the concept of entropy is important in the definition of loss function. And the key thing with this slide is to use it as a paper load. And we spoke about Kevin Murphy the other day in terms of relative, relative entropy is one way to measure uh, this, this similarity, the similarity rather, of two probability distributions in Q. Now we've got some machine learning basics, and, um, and that's, I guess, the purpose of the talk. We'll get, um, we'll, Let's go through some basics in deep learning, in the reinforcement learning, and see how that fits into the overall artificial intelligence. And so we've got a training error, measures the error in the training set, minim uh, minimizing, which is the optimization problem. We've got the generalization error, and we've got machine learning error. The key things we're really looking for is underfitting and overfitting. So that's, that's what we're looking for. Um, and then you're looking at the bias, various trade-off, and we'll put it in the next slide. More about bias, very much better. But in terms of overfitting and underfitting, that's the kind of the job that's to do. And, and I think we had a couple of questions earlier about that. And then we talk, we're looking at regularization as a technique. So regularization as a technique in terms of the cost function to reduce the generalization error. Okay? And cross validation as well. The important takeaway with this, with this is the no free lunch theorem. That really is a per. I mean, and, and I, we're getting some nodding heads, so I think we know what that is. Okay, so you know, it's, and that's re, that's re, that's really important. No, one out of how to use regression. You really need a promise that you really need to know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Question on the regularization. So, is that a uh, as an as an inbuilt penalty function depending on what loss function you're using? Yeah. It, yes, it's added towards the end, and I've got a slide on that. It's sure. two slides, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll show you what it is. Uh, and here's the something that says you uh, bias and variance. I mean, that's high bias, that's just right, that's not the point of change, you're not going to be fitting uh, with high variance. Okay. And, and, and here's, I guess, the correct recipe if you're looking at quality machine learning, which I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, we're familiar with, so I won't go into that in too much detail. But here, here's regularization. And 
that's you're just trying to see so you've got the weights and biases there. Uh, you've got y hat uh, and y and here. Here we're just looking at three locations right now. And that's what the regularization is going to be for. And you've got different types, whether it's an L1 L2 regularization or an L1 regularization, depending on what you're trying to achieve. And if we're going to put that together um, in um, when we minimize the loss function, we're just looking, we're just adding it as a term there. So in terms of your question, um, so yeah, we go back there. We've got the regularization function here. And we're just adding it in the end. So that loss function would be like a one over the total sum of the sum of y to the end. The loss of y hat and y. Okay. And then, and, but once again, these are just some maths. That's all. Just, um, just things to prepare. And, and and actually, just to, to, to be fair, a lot of this was taken from Andrew Eames course, um, which I, I strongly recommend. Um, it, it's a wonderful course. It's a wonderful presenter, and you learn a lot. Of I asked that uh, yeah. the statistical learning books that you mentioned about, what's the, what's um, the author? The, the, asset, uh, the Essentials in Statistical Learning by Trevor Hastie. H A S T I N. There's a couple of other authors right. as well. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got maximum likelihood estimate, estimation as a common approach to derive good estimation parameters. A gradient descent is really good to just want to minimize your loss function. And we'll leave the, the key thing really was the VC dimension. And I was talking about the futures there. So the, con, the takeaway from that is, is in terms of um, SVM. And I've got an example in a couple of slides there with just a, um, um, a case study on using the MMIST data set and why people were using SVM. And it was really based on this uh, uh, person uh, work. And if anyone's ever got a chance to uh, listen to any work he's done or read his work. work. Yeah. Sorry? Pretty, um, oh, so I need to get back to closer to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Thank you, thank you. I apologize, I, I, I'm walking over there and some of you can't hear me in the room, so I have to apologize. Um, I guess the point I was just trying to make then was about the VC um, dimension. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a lower part of the slide here. It's a it's a very good book. It was used for um, SVM. And very shortly I'll show you a slide where why SVM was considered um, uh, quite a significant achievement, particularly in the late 90s, early 2000s. And here's just a bit more information on regularization, just really just to have a quick look at, just to get some intuition from. Okay. And what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get across it very shortly is in terms of um, our neural networks. Because and just having an understanding of neural networks and you've got your input values, you've got hidden as well as your output, and and then you're using techniques like L2 um, and dropout. And if you follow the slide from say left to right, um, so here for step one, step two, and step three, you you're really just you're speeding up you're speeding up the process a little more and, and making it more efficient as well. Um, so dropout does crazy things like knocking out units on the network. Why does it work so well? The key intuition is um, you can't just rely on one feature and you have to sp um, spread your place. I mean, that's really just the key thing to take away from that. And that just goes into a bit more detail. If anyone's really interested, we can unpack that one week and we can really go into a code something up and see how that works and run something like that and see how that works. Um, it really is just get your intuition and how this then it fits into deep learning and then how that fits into reinforcement learning. Um, remember, deep learning is in contrast to a shallow uh, to shallow learning, machine learning. There are many machine learning now, whether it's such as linear regression and logistic regression, which are two sort of things in the ones for realization, um, ones uh, for, uh, uh, for classification problems, um, and the other's not. And we're talking about um, SVMs and decision trees and boosting, and where you just have an input and input and output layer. Whereas in deep learning, there's between your input and output layer, there's one more hidden layer. Uh, and sorry, just on linear regression, yeah, it was regression, uh, yeah, the regression tasks and logistic regression is for um, classification tasks. And this is just how we look at it. So we've got a logistic regression that's very, very shallow network. Um, and then we, we go into a hidden layer, and then two layer, um, hidden layers, and five hidden layers. 
And if we're looking at that, I mean, how do we know how, how many they are? Uh, we've got those to the, the inputs, X the inputs, and put the five in layers here as well. And Y hats can go out there. That's what we're trying to do. Now, now let's get into more interesting things like the deep learning architecture. And we're looking at a feed forward deep neural network or an MLP. We've got C the CNNs, ResNets, and RNNs. And I'll show you a picture of them first and then I'll go back to the definition. So, this is what our standard neural network was looking like on the far left, and in the middle was a convolutional neural network, and then we're going to a recurrent neural network. And so, if we look at a convolutional neural network, um, I guess Lana Kerns were the best person to refer to um, in terms of the work that we did. So, um, we've got it's a feed for a deep neural network with convolutional layers and pooling layers and fully connected layers. We've got ResNets as well, and we've got RNNs. And RNNs is a recurrent neural network. And the key things in that is LSTMs, so the long short term memory networks, and we've got GR use as well as the scattered color networks. I reckon the key takeaway in this slide really is that um, now is that we've spoken about dropout, um, but also look at batch normalization, which I'll talk about very shortly. And if you're not using batch normalization, please do. Uh, everybody's using it. Yep. Everybody, everybody should use it, rather. Yep. What's the key difference here between CNN, RNN, and RNN and ResNet and RNN? Excellent. And I'm, I'm glad you asked the question is what's the difference between these three? And, and over the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll go into the documentation to show that there's a difference. Uh, effective ones use computer vision, ones use uh, for which is image recognition, and the other ones use for sequence to sequence tasks. Uh, which, and I'll sh show you a bit more information about that as well as the bioreferences and the views that we get from the bottom of the And yeah, here's, here's just a bit about map and batch normalization. And I won't go into it too um, deep here, as I said, we can unpack this at a later date. Um, the key takeaway really is, is batch normalization makes high parameter search problems much easier and makes neural networks much more robust in choice of high parameters. And over the next couple of slides, it just shows how that's done. Um, and I guess look at point 3.1, that's probably, the, if I was going to look at something really quickly right now, that's probably what I'll look, like, look at. And that's this point here. So normalize uh, to have mean zero and standardize unit variance one. And, and this is just fitting it and just working with unit batches as well. Okay. I'll just skip through some of these slides. It really was more just for a bit of intu intuition, a uh, bit, bit of a takeaway. And let's get into deep learning. And uh, this is a particularly interesting slide, and it goes back to the question you, you, you were just asking um, in terms of what's the difference between CNNs as well as RNNs. Um, so we've got a deep neural network, learns representations, automatic from raw inputs to recover the conversational hierarchies in many natural signals. And what I would probably like to uh, suggest here is looking at the example. So I've got the notation of end-to-end -end training refers to the learning model using raw inputs, usually without manual feature engineering, and to generate outputs at AlexNet. Now that's a significant achievement. I mean, if you look back in the history of artificial intelligence, in 2012, that is probably the most, that is uh, it's a very significant achievement. And why? What, why is it? Why is it why well, is that the case? Um, so Krasnevsky was, Alex Krasnevsky was working at um, University of Toronto um, with, uh, I think, Jeffrey Kinkin's advisor. And each year there's a competition in, in Europe um, to build a model to find some images. And, and, and what he did really transformed um, and the field. Uh, there's that algorithms and computations. So there's you know, increasing power. In Computers, improving algorithms, and I'll talk about Vladimir Mir very shortly, the work that um, he, he did, um, but this was incredible. And, but, okay, you've got error, error metrics, or you've got metrics to measure your model. There was, I think, um, the, the team that placed second and third respectively, there's a team, I think Oxford placed second, I think they had an um, error metric of 26%, or 26.2, uh, or something like that, I think it was. Now, University of um, Tokyo, uh, or Tokyo University, they, I think their, their error metric was 26.8. Okay, 
And so there wasn't much difference then. If you look at third and fourth, I mean, it was all around the 26s. He came along and he won with, I think, a score of, I think, 15. Absolutely blew everybody away. And I was like, what, what's he doing? It's one of those Scooby Doo moments where, oh, you know, everybody just looked and said, what's he doing? Okay, this is what we want to be able to do, and, and what can we use it for? Um, so that was quite a significant achievement, and Alex Graves, for about 15 years, um, specialised uh, specialized in speech recognition. Um, that's, that's another great achievement. And, and we're looking at Ilias Siva, we, we're talking about sequence to sequence, and sequence to sequence, we're talking about recurrent neural networks, that's, that's what we're talking about there, uh, for machine translation. And we've got DQM, so Vladimir Me, um, who, we're talking about the Atari 2600 as a test bed, and him developing algorithms, um, to, you know, and there's all these games, I don't know, you might, some, some of you may have seen Ready Player One, that movie, and you've got 2600s, and everyone, you know, wanted to win these games, and had simple games, like I think Pong was a re really simple game, um, and, and some more complex games, and there was that game, and I think there was Seed Quest as well, which uh, the reward wasn't um, apparent. You know, you, you, uh, I think uh, it's this um, uh, you know, swimmer, you know, snorkeler, or scuba dog, that's the word we're for. Scuba divers is trying to, I think, get a reward of an immediate reward of a fish or something like that. But he had to stop and then get some more air to in order to continue. But it wasn't apparent that getting stopping to do something else um, would give him a, a better reward. It meaning that he said gave that many people more points, and that was that was a good achievement. And then we're going to talk about other things as well, uh, and then also talk about problems which are harder in terms of the Atari 2600. Um, and those harder games were like Pitbull was a hard game, and what is Zoom's Revenge was a hard game as well. And what um, and what needs to be done to resolve those problems? And those problems have been resolved. And, and this, and, and, and guys, this is why it's so exciting. These are the glimmeries. A lot of these really challenging things I was talking about earlier, like um, perfect games and imperfect games, those sort of things, they're, they're getting resolved. So I mean, and that's why this period of time is going to be considered to be renaissance of one of the most extraordinary period of times in history. Because then, by solving those games, those testers, they can work on other um, challenging issues. You know, look at things like in healthcare, Alzheimer's disease, and those sorts of things, and utilize re reinforcement learning to, to, to solve those challenges for a better period of time. And I, I find it quite exciting. Uh, there's next advancements as well. So there's capsules. So um, Jeffrey Hinton's working on something called capsules, uh, which um, in about six months' time, there's going to be a huge announcement. By it. My personal viewpoint, we're, look, we're very close to doing a huge announcement about um, capsules being utilised um, with reinforcement learning. That's just the end of the day. Okay, and, and, here's, and here's just something with computer vision. So, we talked about earlier with CNN. So, we're looking at so self driving cars, uh, facial recognition, um, those things. It's something simple, isn't it? Cat or not. So, zero, no, one being. Uh, if we then look at, so I spoke about Alex being a, real, a significant achievement, because this is effectively what he did. Um, and I'll just go, I, I don't want to go too much into it, I just wanted to show you the picture. Um, I have got a couple of slides which then goes into it and shows what it's trying to do. Um, one of the key things out of this slide, just think about the filter size, padding, and stride. Just you know, think about those things there. Um, and stacking things together, so stacking together to actually form a deep convolutional neural network. Um, and this is just a simple example of a cognitive. So we've got convolution formally and fully connected. And there's a yeah, there, although there's a couple of questions there, I won't go into. Um, I'll probably just talk very quickly to this slide, um, just so you can get some intuition. And I spoke about earlier about filtering size. Okay, so. Um, you can still hear me if I do Okay. Yes, okay. Um, we've got, I think it's five by five. Five by five there. And and if you, if you read the top top sentence, it's um, other than uh, other than convolution layers, cognets um, often also use pool lane, pooling lane to reduce the size of the representation to speed up computation, as well as make some features that it detects more robust. And that really is the key takeaway here. So we've got all this information here. Okay, so second, so you know, let's speed speed this up. So I've got filter of three, so S one. All I'm doing is this. 
what's the, what's the highest value there? So I can just go like that. Nine. Nine. What's the highest value? I'll go like that. Nine. Nine. What's the highest value? I'll go like this. Five. What is it? Five. five. Okay. So nine, nine, five. So we've got five by five goes into this. And then we go down one. So strike one. We go down one. And we do it again. Nine. And so on and so forth. And you get that. And, so, and, that's, and that's what it's doing. Yep. So from this context, uh, if, I, if I were to assume here, yep. these values represent the fixing value as an example? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. if we're to unpack that, yes. So and if, let's say we're extracting this pixel value of 995 yeah. and uh, compressing it, in other words, using reducing it, yep. would it still represent the actual? That is fine, I think. Yep, that's fine. Would it still represent the actual picture? Yes, it will. Yeah. It, it, it will, and, and that's that's why it's so exciting. Yeah, it will. Um, okay, and th now this is the uh, the character's challenge in M and IST, um, and and this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, and if we if we if we look at, it, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming everybody knows what it is. Um, if, if you don't, you know, just obviously just read through it. Um, but it, it, it's a, it's a classic classic um, challenge, and I think um, it's generally referred to it as software of artificial intelligence. And if you know anything about genetics, your software is a, a very, a, a, it's a fruit fly. And if you study that, um, you get a good intuition, good understanding um, of, of how that, that works. You can apply to other, um, other things as well. Um, now we've got, with a large amount of training data available, many hours to achieve these respective performance. So this is the thing I really wanted to show. It's like, you know, K nearest neighbors, and that was used. That was I was getting a 5% error, error test error. Then SVNs was a 1%. Then CNNs was below 1%. Then FIGA, yeah. You know, that was the progression coming through. But that was around about the time, deep CNNs, was around about the time we could work at our, um, our percents would be. Uh, around about that time where everyone got really excited and said, wow, this, this looks fantastic. Um, and as well as, you know, um, contraction as well. Um, and this is the a really simple example. So yeah, you, you take you go through all these things and get your cut to pick up. So if you do actually feed it with new images, it doesn't predict uh, will it predict the cat, yes or no, it can actually do that for you. And, and you get a really, really successful for that. Um, and now here's the now here's the RNN component. So here's I, I thought I'd get that question, so I'll just put this here. This is what RNNs can use can use for speech recognition, user generation, sentiment classification. All these different things, and, and that's why that's why it's so powerful. And we'll go into a bit more detail. I guess we will take the next couple of slides. Um, here's some. This is some books I would certainly recommend reading. Um, that's a really good book in terms. Of, it's only about a hundred pages. If you love algorithms, interest in algorithms, buy that book. It, it's really good. Also, subscribe to the website. Um, it's 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 a fantastic book. Um, otherwise, I was starting to start a book and start going uh, across all the as well. But yeah, so the point of why I was talking about earlier is essentially have a good understanding of uh, reinforcement and learning for a good understanding of these things. Right? Okay. So it's, it's taken a few minutes. I'm happy to show you. Slides will be up on the um, we'll, we'll see because I've, I've got about 300 pages here. So I'll, I'll, what we'll do is we'll discuss it over the next couple of weeks, and we'll, we'll, we'll share our social some. But um, yeah, it's it's likely to be. But okay, the reason why I'm, I'm a bit hesitant, there's a few things I just want to go over because I sort of you know, did a brain dump over the weekend. I just want to make sure that everyone's okay. Um, and yeah, this is some basic reinforcement learning notes. Um, if we broke everything down. Prediction problem and control problem, that's the key things we're looking at there. Um, and we can look at SARS, which is state action reward, state action, um, which is an old policy method. And then we've got off policy methods, uh, methods yeah. such as Q learning. Yep. What's, what's a policy? What's a policy? Um, the first sentence would say for a policy. And, and, and what is the term policy a lot in the enforcement? 
Oh, okay. It's it's what you. I guess it's just what you're using to actually determine an action. So you've got state action towards state action. So you, I guess you're just using that to determine what action you're using. And what we're trying to determine is prediction. We want to, we to use to predict something. So um, in terms of um, a good example would be in AlphaGo. Um, they were using policies in terms of what ultimately what they wanted to be able to do is win the game. That's ultimately what they wanted to be able to do. Okay. So it's, it's a health made decision for all, all the circumstances. Uh, it's... Okay. Does it help make decisions for all circumstances? Okay, yeah, I guess it will. It, it will take... It will, Based on what what you're trying to, to predict, it will take consideration what the optimal policy would be to actually to, to achieve that. Yes, so it would it would take that, that consideration. Yes. So what policy do you work yes. with in that case? So sorry, just a question for the back. Yes, yeah, so I have a question. So there are multiple algorithms created. So yep. there's something quite equivalent in what's to be the this and uh, other from here. So whether like a I think I think it was the latter. So I'll I'll get to deep um, QNs. Um, so a good reference is Vladimir Me, um, and I think the paper was in 2012, and he used it for the Atari 2012 um, 12 games, um, and 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 it was really it it was down to stability. He'd probably say it was down to stability and computational power as well. So you can actually compute these things a lot quicker than otherwise, to, so you can get a reward. Yep. Uh, yeah, a set, set of instructions. Yeah, a set, a set, yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've, I've realised, like, as I said, we've had 300 slides, and I've only got about, gone through about 50, uh, which is fine. So what we can do? This is probably in a part one or part two, or I may end up then skip through to some other things, which which I think is something a bit more interesting. So, what I may may with that in mind, um, I may actually just skip through a few things. The key thing really as a takeaway here is um, actually I'll probably yeah, the problem state. So, uh, our relation interacts with the environment over time, and each type of T engages with the state ST in a state uh, space S and selects an action from and an action space A following a policy which is in the agent's behavior mapping from state ST to action AT. Okay. A lot of this may be a bit dense and it's from um, the book. It's actually very interesting to actually go into. However, what I may do is just skip through some of these and just then highlight a couple of things to look at. If we're talking about um, the value function, talk about um, the shortest path problem and a good understanding, a good intuition, for that is graph, uh, graph theory, and there's a wonderful book by Daphne Collar, uh, written in 2009, um, which I would probably uh, would certainly recommend, um, and then how that's applicable to reinforced learning. Um, and okay, what I'm thinking about doing, because this talk was really broken up into, I guess, three key parts, um, and we're just looking at a background of artificial intelligence, we're looking at um, elements. As tools and applications, and applications are really interesting things. And I'm thinking uh, we may actually skip through this and get to the applications with a view that we can then dive back into theory at a later date. Um, but the key thing really is I'm skipping through this is dynamic programming. If we're looking at dynamic programming, um, this you know refer to uh, Richard Bellman. Um, there's a which is one of the people he wrote, and there's also a lot of things that he's done um, to just get a, an understanding. Of dynamic programming, and as well as the reasons why he put dynamic programming on. Uh, we've got TD learning, I've got a couple of um, pseudocodes for the algorithms, and SASA, and this breaking of the boundaries of Parasa. Right. Um, Model based learning, that's actually fairly important to look at. Um, learning using real experience from the environment and planning users experience simulated by the model. And with function approximation as well, which so the, probably the, the second sentence would be the best one. So function approximation is a way for generalization um, when the state or action spaces are larger than continuous. Okay. 
And there's mention of pattern recognition there. So um, if anyone's interested in pattern recognition, I've, I've recommended a book by Chris, uh, Chris Bishop, um, who's currently at Microsoft Research in the UK, um, which you can actually download now. Um, it's, it's a wonderful book in terms of pattern recognition. So could you repeat the name of that book? Um, it's, um, yep, so book by pattern recognition and, and the author is uh, Christopher Bishop, B-I-S-H-O-P. Um, and I, I believe at the moment you can download a copy of that book. Actually, and this is what I might do for the rest of the talk. I'll skip through the slides, I'll highlight some reference points or some contact with people um, who, who are really the experts. They're, they're the guys that actually have, uh, uh, can uh, provide a lot of insight into particular areas. Okay, so this is actually going to be fairly important, a daily triad issue. It's a when you're winding off policy, function of approximation of bootstrapping. This is the building of divergence. Um, and that's that's one of those key things that, that needs that, that needs to be addressed. And, the, and if we unpack that even further, uh, we've got function approximation, we've got bootstrapping, and our policy learning it's like, well, obviously you want all three bit accountable for it. That's that's effectively I guess what I'm saying. Um, so you've got to make a change. Which one's going to be more important? Um, in terms, so you get stability and um, um, cognitive thinking, um, which is really important. Okay. Um, okay. This is a good reference page. Um, so I was speaking about earlier, David Silva, Sergey Levine, um, Ian Goodfellow, Christopher Fisher, um, Trevor Hasty, Kevin Murphy, Andrew Ian, um, I think it's John Shulman as well, uh, is uh, at Berkeley University. Um, but that's a good reading from one of them. He writes a lot of content pages. Um, and there's some reference, references as well. Mm -hmm. Summer schools and um, boot camps. And now, let's, with this information, it's benchmarks as well. And where do we benchmark this? Um, and AL is a yeah, learning environment that was used for the Atari 2600. Uh, and Mark Bellman, and that's, that's a name that we use quite, quite often actually, that work he did. There's Open, a, uh, open AI Gin, uh, Majoko as well, and there's the Deep Mind Lab. And there's uh, dopamine tools, a very recent one in terms of TensorFlow. So I know there's some great work going on TensorFlow at the moment. The police, they've already pre-released it before the official uh, uh, before the official release of uh, TensorFlow version two. Um, that's probably a good area to play around in. Good environment to play around in as well. Now, out of uh, uh, Facebook artificial intelligence research and Yarn the Curve leads as and I think jo, uh, Joelle uh, Pinu uh, from McGill University, she works there as well, who's one, one of those really wonderful ethical um, and passionate people that if you ever get a chance, please um, watch one of her lectures. But they released Alpha and Go, so if you actually want to play around in an environment um, and you're very interested in Alpha Go, that's, that's a good environment um, to, to use as a framework. And once you release this framework, you can utilize to actually um, run code and test, test and test against. Now that was just some fairly basics. And now here's some elements. And what I was thinking earlier, what I might do is skip through a lot of these elements um, so we can get to some applications. Uh, so let's go back here to when. Um, okay, so in terms of the question we asked earlier about deep work, um, why? I mean, it's stabilization, designing end to end approaches, approach. Um, and training and flexibility networks. So that goes into a bit more detail of, um, of DC, oh, um, DC network. Jerry Sassara and Martin Reedmore said, um, if you get a chance, please read up on Jerry Sassara. He, he did um, back up, um, he solved that problem in 1994, or actually 1992, rather. Um, and that was significant, that work that he did solving that. Because when it was sold, it was one of those most it was one of those interesting things 
um, that, okay, we'll solve that, solve the game back, and what else can we use it for? And unfortunately, you couldn't really use it uh, for any of that, is you couldn't really be able for anything else. But it was quite significant. And in what Jared Sarah then went on to do was, uh, if you ever um, heard of Jeopardy, he was the lead um, um, in Jeopardy. And when, you know, I think it's Brad and Shane, I can't remember the people's names in Jeopardy, but they, they um, um, Deep Blue, um, it was Deep Blue from IBM, won the Jeopardy game uh, and defeated, Je uh, defeated their opponents. And he and that was quite a, quite a milestone as well. But if you actually look at some analysis or any statistics with what Jerry Tassara, Tassara did in 1992, and you, and you compare it now to, say, 25 years ago, now, there's not really that much difference. And I, and I want to be able to I'll socialise one day what I'm talking about. That was the work done in 1992 in terms of the performance of the algorithm compared to today. And the only real difference was computational power. And that was really the only difference. And that was quite a seminal piece of work, which I found very fascinating. Um, now, we'll, I'll skip through this. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I'll just highlight. I mean, if for um, DQN, if you want to delve a bit more deep, deep into it or extensions of DQN, I'll refer back to the Sutton Bardo book of um, chapter 16 and chapter 11, just to um, deep dive a bit more into it. Uh, and double DQN and Van Hassel. Now, ha this is Haddo Van Hassel. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's currently a deep mind. He, and one of the things that, one of the intuitions, I guess, to take away from this is that somebody does something wonderful and then they socialise it and they publicise it with the code and, and how they, oh, with the algorithm and how they did it. And then somebody else takes that and tries to improve it. In other words, it tries to make it better. And, and that's really the intuition to take away from this. And you've had Vladimir Me did something really wonderful with the, the, uh, DQN and then, um, and then um, Haddo um, Van Hassel came along and said, okay, what can we do? How can we improve it? And I think the key thing um, out of this was just a minor change. So I've got here, it's just a minor change in the DQN algorithm. That's all it was. You know, just a slight change and it actually improved performance. And now we're talking about uh, uh, experience replay or prioritized experience replay, drilling architecture as well. Um, and Rainbow, and this is Haddo again, and this is just taking, combining all these things, all these wonderful things, you know, combining, you know, stacking them all together and seeing, you know, getting a better result, getting a, which is, which is an important takeaway as well. Yeah, I'll skip this. Um, now, G GBS, so uh, this is, just going to go through an iteration of from the original Sutton and Bardo book. So we had the Horde algorithm, then progressed into UV um, FA, and then hindsight experience replay, and that's significant. This slide is actually that's this is actually a fairly significant achievement, um, and and this was work done out of um, OpenAI, and I haven't got the um, I don't have a slide, so I'll just try and act it out the best I can. Okay, so you've got a robotic, robotic arm, and um, I'm trying to pick. I'm trying to pick something up. So, okay, so I've got a robotic arm, and it's just trying to pick something up. Okay, so with uh, well, previously with DDP um, um, G, that's that's what the robotic arm is doing. Now with DQN, uh, so, so with um, with um, hindsight experience replay, that's what it's doing. Okay, and, and that I think that's quite significant. I think that's quite because before it was just missing it, and but with this improvement, um, it, it, um, with this new um, algorithm, it's actually imp improved. Um, and that was wonderful work, as I said, out of um, OpenAI. Um, Elias Siva, um, um, so, so the key author here was um, on, on uh, but yeah, what I was looking at there was if we actually just 
if you just look at the robotics research, have a look there. I, I actually thought that's quite significant, quite a piece of work. Now we've got some tools. Um, so we, we had the question about policy. So policy maps a state to an action or a distribution over actions, and a policy optimization is to find the optimal mapping. And I, and I think I, I think I said that earlier, is what you're trying to find is the optimal, and that's what you're using it for. Okay, so when a policy maps a state to an action or a distribution over actions, and policy optimization is to find the optimal uh, mapping, and that's what we're really trying, trying to do. And it just goes into different things or different algorithms to use. Um, and you've got different methods as well on policy, not policy. And if you just excuse me a minute, I need to plug some power in. <laughs> my, otherwise, my mic is going to go quite quick. So I'll skip through there. This policy search methods. Um, in terms of that, in terms of this, policy search and trajectory optimization, so search out the mean, that was probably that's probably the first starting point I would look at. Um, and these references here, so Peter Bill. And Sergey, they're probably the two references if you're if you're ever looking at anything um, policy search methods, um, and particularly um, Sergey, because from a guide to policy search and perspective of GPS, which is utilised. Uh, um, yes, and so this is John Shulman. And I'm just going to go through, I reckon, just go into the applications. And before I do that, This is actually quite significant, I think. So Judea Pearl, um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him. It's, um, and he's actually quite a, quite a bit in um, um, that Nicola's book of probabilistic or graphical models. Um, he re released a book last year as well. This is, I think, it's really important. Um, so what he does is discusses that there are three uh, fundamental obstacles for current machine learning systems to exhibit human-level intelligence. Adaptability, or robustness, explainability, and understanding of cause and effect connections. The three layer causal hierarchy is association, intervention, and counterfactual. And we can just go, go in and unpack that. So, association is pretty much the question is what is and how would C X change my belief of Y? Intervention is what if and what if I do X? And counterfactual is Y and what if I act differently? And this is going to be quite significant in the in the, in the coming years, or even particularly now, because as I mentioned earlier, I mean, um, most of the, the preliminaries have been done, and what we're now focusing on is, is artificial general intelligence. And this is the significance, and I think this will be fairly significant. Um, and what, what he proposes is structural causal model, which can accomplish seven pillar tasks in automated reasoning. And now, refer back to as well, I spoke about earlier, that the artificial intelligence book um, by Stuart Russell, Kathleen Norby, and those key uh, criteria that was mentioned there. So we've got encoding causal assumptions, we've got catalyst and control of compounding. I, I won't read through them all, but the point really is there's these things there which we've got, we, we can utilise or um, we can refer back to, or which can be utilised and referred back to. And Aviv Tama, there's a wonderful, uh, he's out of um, Berkeley University. Please read, if you ever get a chance, please read um, any papers that he puts together, because I think they're quite exceptional. Uh, this graph, graph, graph networks, so 
as Brent mentioned briefly earlier, and so that goes with reasoning, not with Brendan Lake at all, um, and with human intelligence. So build machine towards human-like learning and thinking, in particular with Shapiro um, causal, uh, causal world models. And this is the big thing, big talk about world models, and Jan McCurdy here um, is, is speaking about world models as well. Um, to support the understanding and explanation and seeing entities rather than just raw inputs and features, rather than just pattern recognition. Aim is to support and enrich learned knowledge grounded in intuition, intuitive physics and intuitive psychology, represent acquired generalised knowledge and leveraging um, composed traditionality and learning to learn and rapidly adapt to new tasks and scenarios. And I, I think that really is the best, the most important point really, is rapidly adapting to new tasks and scenarios. And it just goes on to actually list it. I've got a reference there of um, Josh Tenenbaum, who's um, from the Centre of Brains and Minds in MIT. Um, he's one of those, not, again, one of those passionate and genuine people. If you ever had a chance to watch anything he says, please do. And this just unpacks it a bit further. Intuitive physics, intuitive psychology, and causality. Um, and there's mention about infants. I think that's kind of where we're, we're at. It's like, um, with, with a child, a child goes through various phases um, and they're exploring their environment. And, you know, and, and that's really a lot of the times what they're doing and they're rich fuel. What I mean by that refueling is like, you know, you might be the primary carer or also and then the mother, um, the child will you know, spend some time and then go away. Spend some time and then go away a bit longer. And then a bit longer, you know, that, that period of time increases and then they refuel to get that, get, get a reward. Reward is, you know, it could be you know, a hug or whatever, but it could, could be something, you know, some nurturing back to the, to the carer. But, but initially, you know, it's, it's small because they're, you know, they're a child, so, you know, before, uh, before nine months, and nine months to 15 months, it grow, it increases a bit more, and 15 months, you know, into three years, it increases a bit more. Because what they're doing is searching for independence. They're, they're trying to make, they're, they're reasoning about the world, and they're getting a better understanding of the world. And with better understanding, better reasoning, they can do things. And, and I, I think that's probably it. From an intuition perspective, uh, from, an in, from an intuition is probably the, the, the takeaway from this. But yeah, Brennan Lake is, um, yes, uh, Ed Hall's done some nice work in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of human intelligence. Now, here's some tools, and tools I'll, I'll skip through, except I'll just mention really quickly Chris Ola, um, so L A A H, um, is now there. It's just, that's probably a good person to reference, and as I mentioned earlier, is Alex Graves as well. Uh, sequence to sequence is uh, probably Ilya Sexiva, it's probably a good person reference there. Um, I've got recurrent attention um, models, um, and I think recurrent attention models, I think that was um, Vladimir B, um, M I N H. Also, I think I spoke about earlier. Um, so we'll go skip through there. Um, question and answering is, is coming fairly important, and Facebook, and I've mentioned Facebook. Oh, but I'll, I'll mention again. Is it in terms of what they're doing in art, the artificial intelligence space? It's very left and right. Uh, they've got the right people there. Young McCurr and uh, Joel, um, they're the right people, I think. Um, they, they are, you know, from exceptional with that, uh, Facebook at the moment. There's, there's a few challenges with the company. Uh, but in terms of what they're trying to do with uh, Facebook artificial intelligence research, I think it's actually quite positive. And they're always a good reference point. So DMQs was quite an important thing, um, and I'll just read really quickly. It's like a um, it, so DMQ in which the neural network can read and write from external memory, so that DMQ can solve problems, structure problems, which a neural network without read and write could not solve. And I, I think that was quite similar um, that that piece of work when that came through. Merlin, I don't really know too much about, hence there's not very much on the slide. Um, and we've got some unsupervised learning. Now, with, the, with this, and I spoke about world models, so, and I'll actually skip this slide, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to the next slide. Because this is, I think, fairly interesting. So, um, there's Peter Beale, um, as well as Jan McKern. Um, and if you're an investor, if anyone's watching online, if you're an investor, invest in Peter Beale's company, he's got his t-shirt on, it's, it's covariant, it's, um, it's an educational company, I believe. 
an educational startup. Um, but he, he, does, he uses the metaphor um, at, at the next talk uh, about predictive learning. And he's got Jan the Kurd, um, he uses a cake with a single cherry on top. And his metaphor says that's pure reinforcement learning as a single cherry on the cake. It predicts the scale of reward given once in a while with a very low feedback information content. content. And what supervised learning is the icing on the cake, it predicts category or a few numbers for each input with a medium feedback information content. And what self supervised learning, um, which is, um, has anyone in French here? I think it's Genoese. Uh, Genoese. Um, which predicts any part of the input for any observed part. It predicts future frames of videos with high but stochastic feedback information content. Now that's that's what he he used that as a tool for 2016. So, but Peter Bill came back now. Peter Bill, he's professor of robotics um, at, at University of California, Berkeley, um, and, it's, and he's an advisor to um, um, a, um, a couple of people such as um, Sergey Levine. Is one and Chelsea Finn is another, um, and I'll hopefully show very shortly what the board both, both of they, them are doing. Now Peter Bill um, presents a cake with many cherries, and in his metaphor, it's, it's because he's got many cherries. It's a high information content, and then we hear about hindsight experience replay again. If particularly in, in the area of robotics, this is where I believe we're heading very very quickly and very shortly, and we really are. Um, hindsight experience replay is going to be quite significant. And that was with that example earlier, with DDPG, we can miss it, that's one algorithm. We combine with hindsight experience replay, it's able to pick it up. And, and it, it, there's far reaching things, you know, stack items and you know, stack things. And, um, and I, I think that's quite fascinating in terms of progress. Now, unsupervised learning, I'll skip through. I'll skip most of these parts. Because I think all these are going to be is algorithms that make things better. I mean, that's, um, which was goes off to a man, mantra of uh, Google, what can we do to make it better? I mean, that's um, what, um, it, uh, what, what Google try to do. And that if, you, or, uh, if you are aware of Google, Google pretty much builds everything themselves because of that reason. reason. Um, so in Goodfellow now, he's actually gone across to Apple, which I think is a very good thing. He's now the director of artificial intelligence at Apple, which is really good. Um, and the reason why I think that's really good is he's a very open person he's, um, and he's very ethical um, and he's very good with knowledge share. And I think that's very important because um, Apple's been one of those companies that haven't really wanted to share much. Um, but I, the odd bits here and there, but I think that's going to change, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence. Um, Okay, so we've got GANs. I'll, I'll skip through this. All I really want to say, uh, mention, there's a couple of um, references down at the bottom. So Mark Bellman is probably a really good point of reference. So obviously we started with in Goodfellow, um, but yeah, Mark Bellman in, in the references is good. Um, and there's some references, there's some talks as well, and tutorials as well. Um, so yeah, what I'm trying to do is I'll skip through so I can get to some, some applications. That is how it's been used and the wonderful advancements that have been made. Now, I started at the talk um, speaking about Monty Schumer's Revenge, and that's actually quite a hard game when it comes to um, the Atari 2600 series. And the reason why it's hard, it's you don't know what your immediate reward is um, because it goes down through all these parts, and it's just like, and it goes, you know, so you don't, they don't really know. So it was a very hard um, uh, problem to solve. And if you had the top 50 Atari 2600 problems, it was probably down the bottom. And I think I mentioned earlier, at the top was Pong. That was one of the simplest ones to do. And it's Sequest, which was around about the middle. So that was a good benchmark if you achieved that. Um, and then we got Monty Schumer's Re Revenge and Pitfall, uh, Pitfall rather, and Private Eye. Now, th these problems have been solved now. And I think it was, uh, there's a wonderful paper, I think it was Uber AI. Um, um, Bill um, obviously took um, Vladimir Mee's algorithm and improved it um, and w was able to solve it. And they solved it by playing games by watching YouTube. And their next iteration really was, and this is really this last one here, was using the parlor. And, that's, was, and that, was, that was the algorithm that was used. And once again, I'll skip through a lot of this. If you find anything that's interesting, you can deep dive into it and, and pick, pick, 
some code and actually um, play around with it and, and get a bit, uh, greater understanding. Okay, so I have Minecraft. So now Minecraft, so Microsoft Research out of UK, one of the things they're focusing on at the moment is Minecraft. And you'll hear um, about, and I, I think that's wonderful because, I mean, Minecraft, as you know, is an engineering game. It's, it's one of those things that if you ever want to become an engineer or the children to playing it, they're, they're more likely to uh, you know, become engineers because that's what you're, all you're really doing is solving problems. Um, but but they, yeah, they're trying to crack that. And I, I think they're, they, and nothing has officially been released yet, but I think they're pretty much there in terms of cracking that. Um, and do we actually have the algorithms now to crack it? Yeah, I believe we would um, be very close <coughs> to doing that. And the context of why I'm saying that is if you look at progressing with AlphaGo, what's happened with AlphaGo and how AlphaGo has become AlphaZero and AlphaZero has become um, used for StarCraft and, and, that, and very recently used for protein folding, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later on. And it's won a very a competition very, very recently in terms of um, you know, solving, problem, solving problems in AlphaGo, uh, detecting the media, media analysis and those sorts of things in terms of proteins. So the multi, um, multi, yeah. So this is quite an interesting thing here. Yeah, oh, this is probably a better slide here. So these, these are the people I'd, I'd refer to. Um, and when we started, uh, one of the things I was talking about is single agent problems. We've got two, two player games, and we've got multi agent uh, RO problems. Um, and and yeah, Starcraft two, that was the one for achievement. So. Um, you know, keep my job to crack that, keep playing through with the crack. Now, OpenAI with, uh, with Dota 2. Now, over the weekend, there was um, Dota is part of esports, which was probably one, a huge game. Um, and they had a competition over the weekend, um, which Greg um, um, Rockman, as well as um, Elias Siva, was very excited about. They won. They bet the best human players in the world. And that was quite significant. So you've had, uh, you've had a go. Sheevin beating Lisa Dahl in 2015, if you're interested more about that. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, you can, Netflix at the moment, just watch Netflix. And, and what you'll see there is uh, things such as Move um, uh, 37, which is what the Go program made, which completely fooled Lisa Dahl, which was quite fascinating. But you also had a counter move as well, um, Move in 79, which uh, Lisa Dahl made against Go, which sort of threw we sort of threw David Silver and all those guys off a bit because it's like, well, wait a minute, we didn't expect that to happen. And when you've got these sort of programs, I mean, it's not a simple thing as such as we just have to you know, patch it or they've had to retrain the model in prep and, in, and try to understand why um, Go didn't know what to do when it was uh, faced with something that was unexpected, um, which I thought was quite fascinating. Um, but yeah, so these are the, these are the preliminaries. These have been solved. These, these problems have been solved, and now there's going to be on to more interesting things. And I'll skip through here. I'll uh, talk, talk about game theory here, um, and then that's equal here. And if you, I mean, if you understand about game theory, um, you know, Nash equilibrium is one of those things that you use to actually understand the world around you and understand what you're really trying to do is, um, you know, you've got to, but if all of us here, it's like I'm trying to find what the optimal strategy is. And if everybody has the optimal strategy, I, I can get better. Okay, so I want social limits, capture flag. So that's games, Doha, Doha 2. I'll skip through these ones. Um, this is learning to learn. This is probably going to be. Yeah, this is actually quite good. And the, a good reference here would be Yoshi Abengia, which I spoke about earlier. Uh, I think it's Sebastian Thorn. And um, I, now from memory, I think this is right. Um, I, uh, it, it, I don't know, Unidasty, if anyone has heard of Unidasty, um, he started that. And there's some wonderful courses on Unidasty at the moment in terms of AI. And I, I would strongly recommend it if anybody wants to take a look at it. Uh, and they've also got a good fellow. Who does some of the presentations? Now I'll skip 
through here except just the mention of Chelsea Pin and all that Chelsea Pin. Uh, he's one, one of those people that um, if you ever had a chance to do the presentation, um, very good. And so, as well as reading as well, reading the material. Okay. All right, I want to skip through a lot of this so I can just get to the application. Uh, and except now, just sort of auto machine learning. Okay, that's been solved. It's solved. Okay. Um, and, and, and this is the, the fascinating thing about what NIPS each year, which is the Neural Information uh, Processing Symposium, I think that's what the, what the acronym stands for. Um, and I think it was in 2017 uh, that they were talking about this, and that, that's, that's what it was referenced. That's what they're working on in terms of solving automated machine learning for industry. It's been solved. It's been done. We're talking about supervised learning problems here. Okay. Um, but if um, if you if you look what happened at Google Next 19, they've listed all the things that you know automated machine learning can, can use, and 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 that was expected. What's really challenging is the things that it, uh, it can't really automate. And I'm not just talking about automating um, reinforcement learning, but I'm, I'm hesitant to say that that's going to be the case. Because there's, there's a lot of smarts that are required um, in terms of reinforcement learning. And, and yeah, and just if you're in the industry at the moment, I mean, yeah, just you know, look at GCP. Just use that. Okay, if, you, if you're doing it, it's just um, talk about basic supervised learning here. Okay, in artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, now, here's some applications. So, what does GCP stand for? Uh, so, Google uh, Cloud right. Platform. Okay. Yeah. Cloud what? Platform. Okay. It used to be Google Cloud Engine, and then it was just rebadged to Google Cloud Platform. Okay, now, applications, the interesting stuff. Now, this is what our focus is going to be. And I think particularly our focus, um, I think the focus of reinforcement learning is going to be on education, um, healthcare, uh, and energy. And I'm also conscious of time as well. So, um, and I, I think they're, they're really the quality of life problems, the quality of life challenges. And I think that's where reinforcement learning is going to come, come, come into play. Um, and there's going to be an awful lot of focus in Africa and work we're doing in Africa, uh, looking at, um, look at um, Waste management is one, and water sanitization is another one. Um, and education, and getting infrastructure in place so people um, can get a good education. And uh, there's a wonderful paper, which I'll refer to very shortly, um, that's, that, that can be utilized as well in, in terms in, in, uh, to assist in that. So I will, I will skip through this, because I'll just, yeah, I'll just get to this, this one. So, so Chinook, um, I think it was Marion Tinsley, was the world champion that nobody um, ever defeated, except I think, it was I think this is the one, Schaefer, that then developed um, a program, um, which I, th I think this is right. And I, I, if I get this wrong, I apologize, and I really do. Um, in 1997, because um, this world champion only got de um, defeated five times in the whole world. And, and two of those times was by this computer program. Um, um, but then, sadly, he passed away. And, but he was determined that I needed to keep working on this program. So if I can beat God, well, it's a perfect game, isn't it? So I'll, I'll, if I can defeat God, obviously, I'll, I'll be able to be a champion. And that was quite interesting. Um, we've got Deep Blue as well, uh, which, once again, that's just exhaustive search. So that does, oh, well, well, OK, it's based on big maps. Um, but I found the most fascinating thing here was TD uh, Gavin, and that's Jerry Tassaro. So out of everything here, I I refer you to look at Jerry Tassaro, um, and he's currently at, he's still actually at IBM, and I think I mentioned he did that, and then he went on to do Jeopardy. So he was a lead architect at Jeopardy, and he's one of those people. He, he, I don't think he'll read the presentation, or he won't even read. I don't think he'll read the meeting, but he's just one of those exceptional people. And if you can read it or follow what he's done, um, please do. Because the only difference really is in TV Gavin and now is computation. So if we, we did a plot and we looked at the error metric and we looked at performance metrics, the only difference is computational power. That really is the only difference. That's what we're going to find in 
before. You know, and I, I thought it was quite, quite significant. And AlphaGo is one of the words that DeepMind is in AlphaGo. And there's DeepStack as well. So DeepStack, I think it's Charles University um, at Czechoslovakia, I think it is, um, as well as University of Alberta um, guys working together um, in, in DeepStack. And, and the recent achievement that there's been um, a great um, great talk with Brookman, um, Elisa Siva, um, and their team um, at Wii in the East Coast. And also we've got Star Trek. Um, and these are just the algorithms that are used. Um, okay. Okay. So, and the, the Kubrick ones with the Apple CEO, so Monte Carlo Tree Search, which I played reinforcement learning was really the key one. And it was, I'll expand on that. There were the board games as well. And I've always spoken very highly of. Um, Jerry Cesaro and Go. And Go was really significant. Really significant. This is yeah, the search space of 2050 to uh, 150. That's a huge search space. Uh, but you know, they solved the problem. They, they, they fixed it. Uh, yeah. Now, what I'll skip through here. Because, yeah, I won't go too much now to go. What I would suggest is if you want, we can do a deep dive and we can, we can go through it another day. Uh, just watch the Netflix video just to get a deeper understanding, uh, just to get a good intuition, I guess, of, of the significance. Because uh, effectively, when the game was played, I think it was in 2017, was uh, the biggest audience ever. So the audience was bigger than um, the World Cup of, of Soccer, the World Cup of Football, which is extraordinary when you think about it. Uh, and, oh yeah, so this is yeah. So with the alpha or the alpha series algorithm, this is what this is what it's recommended for. So that that's why I think it's significant. So we've got general game planning, um, yeah, the video games, the classical planning, partial um, observed planning, scheduling, um, but robotics. And I, I can see that work a lot of work in terms of robotics. Uh, and online recommendation systems. Now, I, I will very talk very quickly about problem solving. So I think I just alluded to it earlier. So yeah, they've solved that problem. Okay. Um, one of the metrics I think uh, it was I think it was to do with amino acids. I might have given you as well. Uh, but it was I think the competition lasted for about six months or something, and they, they kept sending it new information through. Um, and the long and short of it really was, I think they they won 40-something, 40, uh, 40 uh, they, they, they were the most successful. And, and I think only one person knows anything about problem solving and deep mind. And they won 45 and the closest other person won three. And if, you actually, if we actually plotted it, you know, they're up here in terms of what they won in, in the amount of games. And this was the hardest category. Everything else is just limited from there down, and the, the closest competitors are one three. And that's using the Alpha Series algorithm. And you know, it's getting the algorithm, training it, training it against itself, and the description box, if that isn't what it was, or so slight improvement, then that becomes a new one, and training it against itself. I think, you know, that, that sort of concept. Um, I don't think that's fascinating, because well, with that information, is you, then you can use it um, for, for more advancements in, sci in science. Um, and they can use it to assist, and that really is what they um, what they want to do is actually use that um, algorithm to assist um, people in scientific research, um, which, which I think is good. But as, as well as addressing that issue of artificial general intelligence, which is one of the things that I'm trying to try and solve. Yeah, deep stack. I'll, I'll just look at um, highlight really quickly. Um, yeah, just have a look at it. You know, just Google deep stack. And heads up, no living hold on poker. Now they're, they're depending on professional uh, poker players. That's quite significant. And that, you know, that's an imperfect game as well. But the space the state space isn't um, known is unknown. Uh, so we spoke about 
um, Atari 2600, StarCraft, uh, there's Minecraft as well, which I think is quite fascinating. And robotics, and, and as mentioned, anything to do with robotics, I would be um, just the work that people are doing at the moment with survey completing, um, as well as chess. And here's a few references here. So there's Peter Beale um, for a deep, uh, deep learning robotics, as well as some other review as well. Now, the interesting thing was Andrew Ng, um, so that Piccolo was um, a device that's for both Andrew Ng and Peter Beale. And they, if you, and I, I think they started working in 2000, and you see this autonomous helicopter. So they're just using it. It's an interesting thing where how fast they progressed from you know, time in a Thomas helicopter to now we've got autonomous vehicles and we've got the go um, output of solving um, real world problems. Uh, yeah, here, here's the lead author behind what they're doing. So, uh, Simpson Real, this, that's another fascinating thing. Um, uh, this gotten, um, off the top of my head, but um, I think it was in 1994 that um, there was a really, really Carl, Carl, Carl something there, um, had had a ball in the middle, it was just 1992, remember, okay, um, and it was just using simple real, so it's just like these, it's a 3D agent just trying to grab a ball, it's just doing this, it's, it's, it's not terribly successful, but the point being that, um, that was in 1992, and, and when you see the recent work that's been done in terms of humanoids um, and how humanoids uh, act. And if you look at there's a really good um, um, video on humanoids um, wrestling or sumo wrestling with each other, and it's really similar. Like you get a reward of one if you knock the other, the other person off, or a reward of zero if you fail. I mean, that's, it, it, you know, it's a very simple thing, but you can see how the, the, the dynamics and how they interact together. And with Joker, if you're, you're a physicist, I mean, I said, uh, using the Joker uh, as well, uh, and this is one of the reference there. Um, and this is yeah, Chelsea Kitty. Uh, her, her work's exceptional uh, and, and quite humbling. Just um, the, the reading some of the papers. Um, yeah, so I'll skip through here. So autonomous vehicles. Uh, yeah, this. So Lex Friedman. Deep traffic. So he's out of MIT. So if you just um, have a look at the work that he's and he's currently doing, it's quite interesting. And he has a lot of talks as well. So a lot of people have mentioned he um, has he interviewed and asked questions of. Um, he did a um, he did an interview with Elon Musk like two days ago actually. Yeah. And yeah. it was kind of interesting. Like he's he's one of the top people, but he was doing um his paper where they used uh, human input as a means to also train AI. Yeah. Elon, Elon Musk, he spent three years on this with a team of 19 people. Elon Musk, Elon Musk was basically, basically like, oh, that's kind of pointless. <laughs> and, and, and so he got kind of, you know, he, he, wanted, he was kind of like two or three times he tried to rebut him, but Elon Musk was like, that's, that's moot in his words. He was like, and it's kind of yeah. kind of interesting. Like, it is tough to say, like, yeah, like kind of, yeah, after three years and 19 person team to say, yeah, it's pointless. Yeah, because it, it, yeah, it's like the Alpha Zero, it didn't need any human knowledge and it's yeah. the best, right? So it's kind of a similar analogy to that. Yeah. Right? yeah. But anyway, I was I don't, no, 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 I just thought it was so comical in a way, like, yeah. I was just surprised how blunt Elon Musk was. It was just like, I guess he's like, now he's like no BS type of person because of everything he's he, gone through. Oh, no, no, his background, he always has been. Oh, he's always and, been and, that and, way. Yeah, he, oh, well, <laughs> well, yeah, he always, yeah. Ha well, he always has been, and, okay. but it's just, it's just, that's yeah. Thing, yeah, it's just pure logic, basically. Like, if it's not, if it doesn't make sense, so if it's not true, then he just says it's not true. Yeah. It's not like emotional. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. That's it. Um, okay, we've got autonomous vehicles as well, um, which I'll skip through, uh, except just just to highlight this. We're very fortunate learning to use for identifying blind spots, and that's one of the things we're working on at the moment. And we've got NLP, and there's an awful lot of information there happening with NLP. Um, the key thing out of that would be from an information retrieval perspective, I think it's Christopher Manning, um, and just looking at the work that he's doing, probably is the <coughs> best one there. And I'll skip these. Okay, dialogue systems. I just want to highlight really quickly in terms of um, there's four categories of dialogue systems. Um, 
chatbots or those sorts of things is social chatbots, infobots, task completion bots, and personal assistant bots. And this is you know, reinforcement learning can be all used for this um, too. Okay. I'm thinking I might just wind it up here because I've got a few more things I can go through, but we'll probably do that at another day. Um, We'll do, we'll do the other ones the other day, uh, except for healthcare. Healthcare is quite interesting, which I thought was fascinating. But yeah, I think we'll just yeah, we'll, fin we'll finish up there. Um, oh yeah, education. I'll finish on education. <laughs> Sorry, there's this um, Northcott. So uh, he, he's out of Harvard. He's written an awful lot of his, um, his thesis was effectively on education, and um, and I can see a lot of benefit. On um, reinforcement learning in terms of education, and I just want to be able to suggest that if you want to read up on that, please do. All right, okay, I'll I'll finish up now. I do have a conclusion, but we'll just leave it at that. I've just looked at the time; it's already been two hours, so yeah, let's just finish it up. All right, thank you very much for coming along. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you.